So let's do another example um, hypothesis test. So in this one we have a coin that was flipped 90 times and of those 90 times 38 heads occurred. Did that happen by chance? Is the coin kind of tricked out? Is it imbalanced in order to get um, actually more tails than heads? Because we really would have expected 45. So we have a difference. Um, we expected 45, but we got 38 heads. Did that difference occur by chance? Is that difference so great that it's improbable that the expected 50% um, is, is, um, it should, really should not be expected, suggesting that the coin is somehow um, kind of a Vegas style coin that's been tricked out to, about to favor one outcome over another. So we're going to test the hypothesis um, that really what we would have expected is that the coin is fair. So this would be the hypothesis that the coin is fair. And the null hypothesis is 0.5 P0. So um, the null hypothesis is always going to be kind of a statement that looks like this, where the population value is equal to some assumed value. The alternative hypothesis A is that the actual proportion is less than 0.5. Um, the proportion of, of heads is less than 0.5 and that would be the alternative hypothesis telling us that it's an unfair coin. So we have our test set up and we're going to use a confidence level alpha um, of 0.5. So this is our confidence level. Alpha equals 0.5. And so once we have kind of the one, two pieces of information, the third thing that we're going to, going to want to drew, draw is this graph here that says this is a left tail test that we're doing. Um, we're assuming that it's a fair coin. And the test statistic, or the critical value of our test statistic is based on that 0 0.05 confidence level. And if we did an inverse norm on that, what we would get is a negative 1.645. So that is our, our rubric of sorts. So now let's um, do a bit of analysis to see what we would conclude. So this was the assumption. We did the test. And our test statistic told us, this is our test statistic, told us that our sample proportion was 38 out of 90. And that 38 out of 90 is 0.422. Um, and I think, let's see, do we have enough here? So now that we have our test statistic, let's see how far that is from our null um, proportion, from our null hypothesis. So our test, well, we have our sample. Our test statistic is going to be this here, um, p hat minus these values here, p naught, q naught, all over n, take the square root of those. And so that's going to be our 0 0.42222 2, 2, 2, 
minus our 0 0.5 divided by um, P naught Q naught, so that's going to be 0 0.5 and then 1 minus 0 0.5 all over the number of individuals or number of samples or coin flips in this case, which is 90. And then we want to take the square root of that. So if you do the math on that, what you end up with is a z value of 6.94. Uh, no, that's not correct. It's a z value of negative 1.48. So our z value of negative 1.48 doesn't take us all the way over into the rejection region. So that's not strong enough evidence for us to reject the null hypothesis. Um, so that's, we could stop right there. So we've done our test statistic and um, the absolute value of our test statistic is actually less than, it doesn't get there, uh, our critical value, meaning that 1.48 is less than the 1.645. So we didn't quite reach into the blue area. We didn't pull it all the way into the mud. Um, so that's a bit of evidence that tells us um, not enough evidence to reject. The null hypothesis. So the evidence is not strong enough for us to reject the idea that it's a fair coin. Right? There's not enough evidence to reject the idea that this is a fair coin. So um, doesn't mean that it's fair. It means that we don't have enough evidence to reject this idea of it being fair. Now, the p-value for that negative 1.48, so that's one conclusion, one way of concluding it. The second way, which has to give us the same conclusion, we know that this value is going to be less than the 0 0.05 because the 1.645 and a 0 0.05 are connected. Um, so the p-value and 1.645, uh, 1.48 rather, negative 1.48. So the p-value is going to come from normal CDF on your calculator negative infinity all the way up to negative 1.48 um, and that is 0 0.0694 or 6.94 percent not low enough evidence not low enough probability for us to reject the null hypothesis. Uh, hypothesis. Um, so that's the second conclusion since the p-value um, is not less than, so since the p-value is greater than um, the 6.94, or greater since the p-value is greater than alpha, right? What that means is that since the 6.94 is greater than or equal to the 5 percent, um, we can make the same statement that there's not enough evidence to reject 
the null hypothesis. And then one final statement. We chose to not, uh, we chose, well, we, we observed that we didn't have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Notice that if alpha had been chosen to be 10%, then in fact, we would have rejected the null hypothesis. So the level at which we select alpha has some real impact on our decision as to whether or not we reject the null hypothesis. If alpha is too low, there's a greater chance that we could reject the null hypothesis. Um, so there is the possibility of, re of, of making alpha too low and um, and then therefore maybe rejecting a true null hypothesis. Um, so that would be a type 1 error. Right, a type 1 error is to reject a true null hypothesis. A type 2 error um, is to fail to reject a false null hypothesis. So if alpha is really, really high, the null hypothesis could be false, and we could fail to reject that false hypothesis. So high alpha um, could result in a, top, a type 2 error. So let's, what are the, the two types? Um, let's say that the null hypothesis is true, or it can be false, and our decision is going to be um, fail to reject H0 or to reject the null hypothesis. So if we fail to reject it, and it's true, right? Let's say we don't get enough evidence and we fail to reject it, and it's actually true. That's a good thing. We have failed to reject what is true. So that would, we can make the correct decision here. There's no great risk with that. Let's say that the null hypothesis is just false and wrong, and our evidence ends up with us rejecting it that too would be the correct decision. So what we're concerned about are these type 1 and type 2 errors. Um, so if we reject the null hypothesis and it's actually true, then that's our type 1 error. Or if we fail to reject a false null hypothesis, um, then that's a type 2 error. So if alpha is really large, if alpha is 20%, then, um, or if alpha is 15%, then 
that makes a difference as to whether or not we end up rejecting the null hypothesis or not. So in our case, we chose 10% and we ended up, um, we chose 5%, right, and we ended up rejecting the null hypothesis. At 5%, we rejected the null, we chose not to reject the null hypothesis. At 5%, we did not reject the null hypothesis because the 6.94 wasn't sufficient evidence. So at 5%, no rejection. At 10%, then we would reject it. So the higher value of alpha um, also increases the risk of rejecting the null hypothesis and also rejecting a true, therefore rejecting a true null hypothesis. Um, and if we do that and reject a true null hypothesis, we're more likely to commit a type one error. So the other name for alpha um, is that it's also considered the probability of rejecting um, the null hypothesis. Um, rejecting a true null hypothesis. Um, or stated another way, it's the probability of committing a type 1 error. So if you want to lower the risk of maybe sending an innocent victim to jail, um, then use a low alpha. You can think about it like that. Um, make alpha low enough because we don't want to risk rejecting the truth. We don't want to re risk, um, uh, or at least we don't want to increase the probability of rejecting a true null hypothesis. So alpha, another name for it, other than significance level is that it's also the probability of committing a type 1 error and a type 1 error is similar to sending an, an, an innocent person to, to, to jail. So the probability of rejecting a true null hypothesis is alpha. The probability of rejecting, um, the probability of failing to reject a false null hypothesis is what we call beta. Um, and so that one um, takes a, we'll, we'll try to dig into that idea of beta a little bit later. That one takes a little bit more thought, but the probability of failing to reject a false null hypothesis is beta, and the power of a test, um, so-called power of a test, is 1 minus beta.